announcements that are not on our bulletin that we need to mention at this time, make note of or anything. Yes, yes. All right, for next Sunday's fellowship for the patriotic musical thing, we're going to have services and have a dinner, a fellowship dinner, and then come back in for the patriotic, patriotic musical. We need as much people, to, many people to sign up as possible, as much ice cream, homemade ice cream. If I buy a Bluebell ice cream and I put it in one of those deals, <laughs> do you think that you'll be able to notice the difference? What if I win? That's going to say something. Yeah. <laughs> you ever wonder how they get so much flavor in those little buckets, don't you? You just wonder. So not Bluebell ice cream. If you fail to meet the ice cream quota, we'll have to go to Brahms. We'll be forced to go to Brahms. But if you make homemade ice cream, we'll take as much as we can for next weekend's fellowship dinner. Any other announcements? All right. Well, that's all. Yes, ma'am. Somebody else can use your, your ice cream maker? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can use it as long as we keep it full when you get it back, right? All right. Anything else? All right, let's all grab a book and sing together. Now, in addition to homemade ice cream, next week I'm in need of an old white outdoor rocking chair. If any of you happen to have one of those on your porch or one in good, fairly good condition in your yard somewhere, if after the service tonight you would let me know, that'll keep us from having to borrow one elsewhere. You know, if we can keep things at home, that would be really nice. So an old, large, white rocking chair, okay? Hymn number 273, as we continue our worship song in song, He Hideth My Soul. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the crib of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows of Christ. Tis the blessed hour of prayer. We'll sing the first and last stanzas. Tis the blessed hour of prayer when our hearts all bend and we gather.
trusting Him we believe that the blessings we're needing we'll surely receive. In the fullness of this cross we shall lose every care. What a balm for the weary, oh how sweet to be there. Blessed Would you stand with me as we sing our offertory hymn, number 445, Day by Day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials. As we prepare to take the evening offering, we again want to go to God in prayer and ask his blessing on this offering. Ask his blessing on the prayer requests that we have. We do have several on our prayer list. And again, I'd ask you to remember Brother Brian DeJarnett and his family, Sister Rosa, as they are suffering the loss of his mother this morning uh, to her battle with ALS. Uh, keep them in your prayers. But before we pray, I'd like to take a few moments and take requests. If anyone on this side have a, a prayer request, just... Donna Lee's mother passed away. Passed away. Donna Lee's mother did. All right, remember this request. Any others on this side, yes, Brother Arvel? Yeah, Katusa, our mission is going to start their vacation Bible school tonight. And we pray that this will be very fruitful. It was very fruitful for them last year. As uh, most of the additions they have seen lately have been as a result of Vacation Bible School last year. So pray for them. Anyone else on this side? How about on this side over here? Any prayer requests? All right. Let's remember this. Uh, also, I guess by now you probably know Sister Christina Ledbetter uh, has a... A cancerous brain tumor uh, and they're 
it's an inoperable brain tumor as well as it's growing down into the brain. If you remember Paul and Christina, uh, Paul did a lot of our tile work for us back here. But pray for that family and uh, for the treatments that she'll be undergoing very shortly uh, that the Lord will intervene and help uh, in her need. And I know there are many others in our church. Uh, it's good to see some of you that we hadn't got to see lately. Some of you have been Brother Matlock. Good to see you. It's good to see the Cheatham's and, and, and the Allen's and many others that have been suffering with health issues. And we're so glad and thankful that you're back with us. But remember all these. How about unspoken prayer requests by this sign? Seeing these, let's go to God in prayer and ask his blessing at this time. Father, we do again thank you so much uh, for all the blessings that you've given us. And sometimes, Lord, we, we, we focus more on bringing our petitions to you because we have so many. We have hurting hearts and we have illnesses and, and problems that people are facing every day, people who are suffering loss. But, Lord, we want to be sure that we, uh, we come to you in thanksgiving as well as in supplication and intercession. And, Lord, you have been most gracious to us and been exceedingly kind and merciful, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace to face each and every day. We thank you that you're there for us moment by moment. And Lord, we thank you for the strength to serve you in your kingdom's work. We thank you most of all for Jesus Christ and for his sacrifice. And Lord, we could never thank you enough for what he's done for us. All we can ask is for strength to serve you in return for your grace and mercy. Father, we do lift up the prayer requests that have been mentioned to you tonight that you would touch each life and each issue, Lord. Every surgery may it be guided by your hand. The families that are suffering loss, may they be comforted by your spirit. And Lord, the bodies that are afflicted, may they be healed by your power. May you lighten the burdens that so many bear by helping them to see and feel your presence in their life. And we pray that you would teach us to trust you always and to look to you always. May you bless this offering to your kingdom's work. And bless each one who gives and bless everything that it goes to. May your kingdom increase. May your son return quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by, till the storm passes over, till the thunder Ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> this morning I mentioned that's one of my favorite songs. Appreciate that, Brother Sam. I may want to preach that sermon again I preached this morning. <laughs> but we're going to move along to chapter 5 of Mark. Mark chapter 5. I love that title. Let's just look at that for a moment. <laughs> Appreciate Kara finding a tombstone to put up there. Chapter 5 has been called the home for incurables because this chapter describes three cases that humanly speaking are incurable 
We read about the demonic man, the diseased woman, and a dead girl. Now today, we would send the man to a mental institution. We'd send the woman to a terminal care unit. And we'd take the girl to the cemetery. But there are no incurables with Jesus. He met all three of these cases And showed that He is our all-sufficient Savior. So we're going to look at the first uh, case tonight. The man who is commonly referred to as Legion. Because he was possessed by many demons. Matt says this is the nude, rude dude with a bad attitude. That would have been a good title too. We're going to look at the story of the taming of the tombstone terrorist. A picture of what it means to be lost, but also showing us how Christ can transform a life. Why don't we stand together as we read the text this evening to show our reverence to God's Word. Chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, a demon. Matter of fact, many demons. This man had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, the fetters broken in pieces, Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, a matter of fact, these were the demons in him speaking, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh into the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, And all the demons besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled, and towed it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. They came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the demons and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. We're going to stop there. We'll look at a few other passages, uh, verses here in a little bit. But you may be seated. I love preaching through the Gospels. I love reading these stories and seeing the great power and wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see the the taming of a terrorist, one who had terrorized that part of the country for a long time. They had tried to bind him. They had tried to tame him. I guess trying to rehabilitate him. But none of that worked until Jesus came along. So first, let's see a miserable soul here in this poor man that was possessed of demons. There are three things we note about him. He was already demented by these demons. He was a wild man living in a graveyard. He evidently had supernatural power because of these demons. No man could bind him. 
He would break the chains that bound him, the fetters. But then he met Jesus, who set him free from his bondage to sin and Satan. Now here was a candidate for the insane asylum. I would tell you, the worst form of insanity is spiritual insanity. We got a lot of those folks around today. Like the prodigal son who came to himself in the pig pen. We've got lost people all around us that are not aware of their lost condition. And they need to come to themselves. They need to see, and we're going to probably have to help them see it, their true condition without Christ. They need Jesus. I believe, by the way, that we're experiencing in these last days a resurgence of demonic activity in the world today. Matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that at the end of time, when Satan sees that his time is short, that he is going to uh, increase his efforts against the kingdom of God. So whether you know it or not, the devil knows we're in the last days. And he has increased his activity, his intensified this because he knows his days are numbered. And we're witnessing today the immoral filth that Satan is pouring out in his wrath. We're overrun with unspeakable crimes, with rampant dishonesty, with pornographic obscenity. By the way, I believe demons are real. Now, I know a lot of people today, a lot of preachers today dismiss demons that they are mythological, they don't believe in them. I believe the Bible. Therefore, I believe in the reality of Satan and a demonic host, millions of fallen angels that do his bidding. And they are very active. Now, you know, I don't believe a believer can be demon-possessed. If you're a child of God, I don't think it's possible for a truly born-again child of God to be possessed of a demon because you're possessed of the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Can you imagine him having a demon for a roommate? I don't think he'd allow that, would you? But lost people can be demon-possessed, and many are. Now, a believer can, though he cannot be possessed of demons, I believe a believer can be oppressed by demons. I mean, you can get to the point away from God and, and in a backslidden condition to the point where the demons can have some influence on your decision making and on some of your activities. So we need to be very careful about getting involved in anything that is of the occult. Because that's just opening the door for demons to do their worst. You ever heard of the Chinese water torture? A victim is chained under a constant dripping of water upon his head. And eventually the nervous system just explodes and the person goes crazy. The constant dripping of water. It reminds me of a proverb says a continual dripping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. <laughs> now some, some guys are married to a Chinese water torture. <laughs> Just constant dripping. But anyway, that has nothing to do with the sermon. Let me go on. <laughs> Second thing I want you to see about this miserable soul is he lives among the dead. He, he lives in a cemetery, living among the tombs. One preacher told of finding an abandoned graveyard outside of New Orleans. The graves had been opened and people had opened them up to look for rings and gold fillings uh, from the skeletons that had been buried there for so long. They were mostly alcoholics and drug addicts looking for something to sell for more booze and more drugs. 
And they would actually find some of these guys would crawl into these graves with their wine bottles and sleep on top of the skeletons. Now they were living in a cemetery. Now most people don't even want to live next to one, let alone live in one. Say amen, Betty. Where's Betty? When I pastored over in Greenwood, Arkansas, the, we lived in the parsonage, and on one side of us was a cemetery, and across the street, across the highway, was a cemetery. And we'd wake up a lot to hearing the grave diggers opening another grave. Matter of fact, uh, some of you might know Tommy Hart, longtime pastor in Arkansas. Uh, Greenwood was his first church to pastor. He was 18 years old, a young single guy when they called him to be their pastor. And he, he could not take living next to a cemetery. It just really spooked him to live there alone without anybody. So he went out and found a wife <laughs> and moved her in. So if you, if you know Tommy Hart, that's kind of amusing to think of him now, but uh, that's the way it is with a lot of people. Betty didn't really care about living next to a cemetery. But here is the living, living among the dead. This man's place of residence actually reflected the condition of his soul. He was a dead man living among the dead, spiritually dead. You know that. The Bible says that the lost man is dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. The lost person is spiritually dead. That's why they're so hard to talk to, isn't it? You've got to overcome that. So he was among the dead. And, and number three, he was absolutely defeated. Nobody could help him. Here was a wild man, a legion of demons living in him, and he was a terror. He was the tombstone terror. Can you imagine his shrieks and his screams through the night? Can you imagine little children hearing him and, and running to their parents and saying, Daddy, Daddy, Legion is coming after us. They were terrified of this wild man. But it pictures the lost man today. The lost man is in a miserable state. They're addicted to sin. They're under the control of Satan. And the world cannot help them. The world will try to, to do things to remedy this, but what they need is Jesus Christ. Amen. Bible says the wicked are like the troubled sea. It says there's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Now let's look at the mighty Savior. We see the Lord Jesus Christ enter the scene here. We see a mighty Savior and, and you see him, his, his perception of this problem. When Jesus saw him, he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirits. He's not even talking to the man, he's talking to the demons inside this man. Jesus sees something that the others did not see. Matter of fact, that's still true today. Jesus looks at a person, really not what that person is right now, but what that person can be. If they would just allow Jesus to come in. Right? Jesus looks at a Jacob, the conniver, but he sees Israel, a prince with God. Jesus sees Simon bar Jonah, but he really sees Peter, a rock. He looks at Saul of Tarsus, another terrorist, persecutor of the church. That's what the people saw. Jesus saw an apostle Paul. He saw the potential in these people. And a lot of times we write people off, we say they're hopeless, but we don't see what Jesus sees, do we? There's been many that have been transformed by the power 
of Jesus Christ. Here was a guy everybody feared, everybody tried to avoid him. Jesus comes along and he has compassion. Somebody said that they believed he made that special boat ride across the sea through a storm just to get to this one man who was ready to be delivered. That's the extent he went to to reach this man everybody else had given up on. Not only do we see his perception, but we see his power. You see the power of Christ over this situation. This man called Legion, under the power of these demons, but they met somebody that has power over Satan and all demons. The demons have to obey Jesus. They have to recognize the authority that he has. He is their creator. Now, he didn't make demons. He made angels who fell and became demons. But every time Jesus confronted demons, they had to obey him and submit to his authority. So they're at the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you see that in how they respond to him. They cry with a loud voice. They're afraid. This idea of that torment me. The idea is that Jesus could send them to Tartarus. Jude talks about a place where demons are kept in bondage, awaiting the judgment day. See, not all demons are allowed to roam free. Some demons are locked up. Those who kept not their first estate, Jude says. Not all demons have freedom. And there comes a time when evidently God will cast those who have liberty into Tartarus, that place where the demons are locked up. And that's where they're all going when Christ comes back, by the way. So these demons were fearful that Jesus might cast them into the abyss. And they beg him not to do that. They ask permission to enter a herd of hogs. Now, if these were Jews... They shouldn't be raising hogs, amen? They're in the black market here because pork was considered an unclean food in the dietary laws of Israel. I don't believe they were Jews. I believe, I believe these were Gentiles. If you go visit Israel today, you'll visit this area on the other side of the Galilee and on that side were Gentile villages in the first century. And there was another one uh, Tiberius Caesar had one named after him there on the Galilee. So there were Gentile villages around the Sea of Galilee. And I believe these were Gentiles in the hog farming business. And that's something else. Jesus makes this special effort to go save a Gentile. And all you Gentiles said, Amen. Amen. Thank God for that, right? So he allowed the demons to enter the hogs, which promptly caused them to commit suicide. They go jump off the cliff. The first case of deviled ham in history. Now there's something I really had never noticed about this story until this week. Legion speaks of 2,000 or more. In the Roman army, a legion of soldiers would be 2,000 or more soldiers. So we're talking about 2,000 demons in one man. And he's able to tolerate 2,000 demons. They go into 2,000 hogs. Do you see this? This is what I've never seen before. There's 2,000 hogs there in verse 13. A legion of 2,000 demons leave one man, enter into 2,000 hogs, that would be one demon per hog. And a hog couldn't bear one demon, let alone thousands. I thought that's interesting. I mean, doesn't it just show the capacity for man to bear evil? If a man can host 2,000 demons, but a hog can't handle one, he wants to kill himself. It illustrates a human capacity for evil. 
Well, after this, the people came out. They saw this man in his right mind. But instead of rejoicing, let's read on. I stopped at verse 16. Look at verse 16. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the demons and also concerning the swine, what happened to them. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coats. They're telling Jesus they want him to leave. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the demons prayed him that he might be with him. Now you see two prayers here. Verse 17, they're praying for him to leave. In verse 18, you got this guy praying that he can go with him. That first prayer is a bad, that's bad praying, isn't it? When you pray and ask Jesus to leave, that's bad praying. The second prayer is a good one. He wants to go with Jesus to be his disciple. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not and said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis, which refers to ten villages in that area, how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. So Jesus, no, I, instead of you going with me, I want you to stay here. I want you to be a home missionary. And I want you to testify to all these folks around here what I've done for you. You be a witness for me here in Decapolis. But here are these other folks. They want Jesus to leave. They're mad at him because of the hogs. They lost their herd of 2,000 hogs. They're not happy having Jesus around. He, he's disrupting business. So they pray him to leave. Now think about that. Isn't that what's happening today? Hasn't America basically prayed Jesus to leave? Lord, leave our schools. Lord, leave our government. Lord, leave our courthouses. Leave our institutions. There's no place hardly in America, even many churches don't have a room for Jesus. Not the real Jesus of the Bible. They pray him to leave. And you ask Jesus to leave, he'll leave. He left, didn't he? He didn't stay where he was not wanted. He will not stay in your home if he's not welcome. He will not stay in a city where he's not welcome. He'll leave. But woe unto those who are left to themselves. You don't want Jesus to leave. We need him. We need his blessings. This country doesn't want Jesus changing things. They don't want him hurting the liquor business. They don't want him hurting the tobacco business or the entertainment business or the pornography business. He's not welcome at the feminist movement. He's not welcome among the abortion movement. He's not welcome in the gay rights movement. Amen. No, they say to Jesus and to his disciples, shut up and get out of here. You're not welcome. We don't want to hear from you. And more and more, that's the direction America is heading. By the way, you ever thought when Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign of Christ, You ever thought about a lot of businesses are going to go out of business? The liquor industry is going to go out of business during the millennial kingdom. It's going to be gone. The gambling, the casinos are going to shut down. There's a lot of sinful enterprises that will not be tolerated in the holy kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's going to be a lot different then. Before you take any job, you ought to ask yourself this question. Will this job be around during the millennium? Now, I, I tend to think there's still going to be some preaching going on in the millennium. My job's safe. 
Now, if you're driving a beer truck, your job's probably in danger. If you work in a tobacco shop, you're probably going to have to find a new job in the millennial kingdom. Something to think about next time you interview for a job. Hey, these hog farmers, they were a lot more interested in the commodities market than they were in a poor soul that needed Jesus. And sad to say, there's a lot of church members in the same condition. More interested in material things than in winning souls for Christ. So now let's look at the miraculous salvation and deliverance of this man. First of all, I want you to see how salvation changes people. It makes us new creatures in Christ. You see how it changed a raving lunatic into a man that was sitting and clothed and in his right mind. When a man's heart gets right, it's going to affect the way he thinks, the way he acts, even the way he dresses. He was clothed, it says. I assume he is modestly clothed. When a man's heart gets right, it's going to affect some things. Now, Jesus didn't start off telling the man that he needed to put some clothes on. He got the man saved, and then the man being in a right mind began to realize some things needed to change. He could not be the nude rude dude anymore. He's a new creature in Christ. I wonder if some of our members just need to get saved and maybe they get more modest in their dress. And quit exposing themselves so much. Get in your right mind and start dressing in a way that's going to bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, salvation is an inside job. So I say, well, when I give up drinking, I want to get saved. Giving up drinking is not going to save you. Matter of fact, beer beer drinking is not the problem. That's just an outward symptom of an inward problem. The problem is on the inside. Salvation will change a person. Secondly, salvation will control a person. Now we know that the people tried to control this guy. They They would bind him. They would try to tame him. But nothing worked. It was all to no avail. It's still the same way today. The world tries to solve the crime problem by locking people up. By sending them to a rehabilitation center. By giving them counseling and and, and psychiatry and psychology. Has that helped any? Is crime still on the rise? Hasn't helped much, has it? Didn't help this guy either. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can renew a sinful heart. We don't need more prisons. We need more Bible-centered, fundamental, soul-winning churches in America. That's what we need. We need to get the Bible and prayer back where it once was. Then finally, salvation challenges us. After this guy gets saved, he wants to join Jesus and his disciples. If he's a Gentile, that probably wasn't going to work out too well because Jesus had gone to the house of Israel first. But he says to this Gentile convert, listen, I've got a better job for you. I want you to stay here and be a home missionary to Decapolis. I want you to go around and tell people what I've done for you. These people that ask me to leave, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to stay, but I'm going to leave you here. And I want you to be my witness. Now Jesus has left and gone back to heaven. But he left us an assignment, didn't he? We say, Jesus, can't we go with you? After we're saved, can't we just go to heaven now? No, I want you to stay here and be a witness for me. I want you to tell others what I've done for you. How I've delivered you 
from bondage to sin. How I've cleansed you and how I've changed you by the power of God. That's our job. Now what did this guy do? He said, fooey on that, he went home and watched sports on television. No. Look at verse 20. Highlight verse 20. Circle it. Underline it, folks. He departed and began to publish the great things Jesus had done for him. Now, I want to tell you something. If we can somehow figure out a way to get the members of Florence Street Baptist Church to do verse 20, we're going to see some mighty, wonderful things happen here. I've only had 25 years to figure this out. I've not yet figured it out. We need to do verse 20. This week, you need to do verse 20. You need to tell others what Jesus has done for you. Not be afflicted with spiritual lockjaw, but open your mouth. Do you like to gossip? Now, there's some, there's some good ways to gossip. I want you to go out this week and gossip about Jesus. Just go out and talk about him. Tell others about him. And point them to Jesus that they might be saved. And that's our commission. That is our marching orders. He published it in ten towns. That's what Decapolis means, an area composed of ten towns. He went from town to town ringing ten bells, praising the Lord Jesus Christ. And what effect did it have? All men did marvel. They listened. They saw a difference in this man. I would say that probably many of them became believers. The children that once ran away from this guy are now being rounded up on a bus and being taken to Sunday school. I'm modernizing it a little bit, but you see what I'm saying? The kids aren't afraid of him anymore. I could see them sitting around this man listening as he tells them about when Jesus came how he used to be and how he is now because Jesus made a difference in his life. Jesus tamed the tombstone terrorist. Has he changed your life? Hey, are you a daily testimony to the power of Jesus Christ? Are you telling others about him? Are you letting the devil influence you and keeping you from giving due glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, are you consecrated to Christ or are you living a defeated life? Too often I think we leave this place with unconfessed sins in our heart. I told you before, I, I wish somebody would invent a sin detector. We could put it at the door. You now you go to the airport and they got the metal detector. It beeps when you go through. See, if we had a sin detector... And you start to go out and it goes beep, beep, beep. I say, all right, come back in here. <laughs> You've got unconfessed sin. Get back in here. Let's go. You can't leave with unconfessed sin in your heart. Hey, by the way, I think we do have a sin detector. His name's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he convicts us of sin. Not only sin of commission, but sin of omission just not doing what we've been called to do. And many of us are guilty of that. So I want to challenge you. Let the Lord examine your heart tonight. Are you clean? Are you consecrated? Are you faithful in witnessing to others? And if you're not saved, you got, you've got to choice to make tonight Jesus has come to you in this service now you can do what Legion did that demon possessed man you can receive Jesus to your salvation or you can do as the people did and you can pray Jesus to leave you alone and he will 
He will. You can walk out of here still lost, unforgiven. But Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. As we stand together, we had this hymn of invitation. Lindsay, if you'll come ahead and get ready, we're going to baptize Lindsay here in a few minutes. But while they're getting ready for that, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you're here tonight and God has spoken to your heart and there's something that God is calling you to do tonight, some public decision that you need to make, we want to invite you to come and make that known. decided to follow Jesus that's the best decision you can make tonight would you come sing another verse I'm sure there's others here that need to come you need to obey God's will tonight don't put it off to another time you need to come come now 